Nucleic acids. Nucleic acids, particularly DNA, are important because they code for all the proteins that an organism will ever need to make. And because proteins have so many different functions, these nucleic acid codes are critical in ensuring that an organism develops and functions appropriately. There are two types of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. They differ both structurally and functionally. Structurally, they appear quite similar, except that DNA is two-stranded and RNA is single-stranded. They both have a sugar phosphate backbone to which some nitrogenous bases are attached. The nitrogenous bases of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, are cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. The nitrogenous bases of RNA are cytosine, guanine, adenine, and uracil. The difference here is that thymine is present in DNA but is not present in RNA, and uracil actually takes the place of where thymine might be on an RNA strand. So DNA is double-stranded, RNA is single-stranded. They're made up of almost all the same bases except for thymine is present in DNA and uracil is present in RNA. DNA consists of hundreds of thousands of genes which code for proteins. This is its big job and its big claim to fame. It's a unique molecule in that directs its own replication and we don't know of too many other molecules except for prions that do that. DNA is also inherited from parents. RNA is involved in the expression of genes because it's involved in protein synthesis and there are three kinds of RNA. There's messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA. We'll see what all of these do when we talk about protein synthesis. Another difference between DNA and RNA is that the sugar on the sugar phosphate backbone is different. DNA consists of the sugar deoxyribose whereas RNA consists of the sugar ribose and if you look very carefully at them uh, you will see that the difference here is that while there's an oxygen present in this location on ribose it's absent in deoxyribose and that's how it gets its name. Deoxy means an oxygen has been removed basically or there's one less oxygen. It's important with deoxyribose to be able to account for all of the carbons and in fact the carbons have specific names or numbers. Carbon 1, carbon 2, 3, 4 and the fifth carbon is actually not part of the ring structure. If you look at this sugar you'll see that it has carbons at each of these corner locations except for this one here where it's an oxygen and so if we actually imagine that the oxygen is a zero and we count our way around uh, we'll see that the fifth carbon is actually the one that is not in the ring structure. This becomes important when we start talking about the nucleotide orientation in the DNA molecule. Let's just take a moment to talk about the bases. There are two types of bases. There are purines and pyrimidines. Both of them contain nitrogen. And with the purine, there are two rings, whereas with the pyrimidines, they're made up of one ring. If we go and we take a look at all of the bases of DNA and RNA, we should be able to determine which are purines and pyrimidines. Remember, purines have two rings, and pyrimidines have one ring. So that includes cytosine, thymine, and uracil. The only two ringed purines are guanine and adenine. The single ring pyrimidines are cytosine, uracil, and thymine. These five bases form the variable parts of DNA and RNA. A DNA polymer is also built by condensation synthesis, but we won't go into the details of that. Each monomer of the DNA polymer or the RNA polymer is made up of a nucleotide. The nucleotide parts are phosphate, a pentose sugar, deoxyribose in the case of DNA, and a nitrogenous base which is the variable part. If we're talking about DNA, the nitrogenous base could be adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine in this location. Here's a segment of a molecule of DNA. From it there are a number of different things we can see. We should be able to pick out the sugar phosphate backbone on each side of the ladder. So this is the DNA ladder simplified. We'll see the phosphate alternates with the sugar. 
This is why we call these the sugar phosphate backbone. The rungs of the ladder are made up of the bases. Remember when we talked about the carbons in the sugar? Uh, well, this is where they become important. So we should be able to label each of the carbons in the sugars on the backbone of the molecule. So for example, with this sugar, this would be the first carbon right here, second carbon, third carbon, fourth carbon, and the fifth carbon is right here. Remember, it's not a part of the ring structure. So if I was to ask you which one of those carbons is closer to the edge of the molecule, hopefully you'd be able to see that it's the fifth carbon. We call this end of the molecule the five prime end of the molecule. If we take a look at the one at the bottom, we count off the carbons, we'll see that the fifth carbon is actually not closest to the edge of the molecule, it's actually the third carbon that's the closest, so we call this the three prime end of the molecule. On the other side, if we do the same thing, we'll see something interesting happens. Here we're counting off our carbons. We'll see that at this end of the molecule, the third carbon is actually closest to the edge of the molecule, so we call it the three prime end of the molecule. And the one at the bottom, if we count off carbons, we'll see that the fifth carbon is actually closest to this edge of the molecule, so we call this the five prime end of the molecule. Now what that means is if, if you look very closely at a glance, you probably already noticed this, that on the left hand side of the molecule, the oxygens in the sugar seem to be oriented toward what we would call the top, and on the right hand side, the oxygens seem to be almost pointing downward, and we basically can see that the two sides of the molecule are oriented in opposite directions and we call this the anti-parallel nature of DNA. And this becomes relevant when we talk about DNA replication. The other thing you should notice from this diagram is that the bases are bonded to each other in what we would call the rungs of the ladder. So if we were to sort of draw out this DNA molecule in sort of a simplified form we would see that there are actually four rungs to this ladder and if this is adenine right here, we could put it here, adenine binds to thymine and if this one is guanine, we know it bonds to cytosine. We have a thymine over here and it's bonded to an adenine and we have a cytosine here and it's bonded to a guanine. If you look really closely, you'll see that the number of hydrogen bonds between adenines and thymines is different than the number of hydrogen bonds between guanines and cytosines. Between adenine and thymine, there are two hydrogen bonds, so we could show that as two dotted lines between A and T, whereas between guanine and cytosine, you're going to have three hydrogen bonds. Here's another double bond between adenine and thymine and another triple bond between guanine and cytosine. So as a rule of thumb, adenine always binds to thymine by a double bond. If we were talking about an RNA molecule, adenine would be bonding to uracil and guanine always binds to cytosine by a triple bond. How is ATP related to nucleic acids? If we take a look at ATP, we'll notice that it's really just a a slightly different RNA nucleotide. It's still made up of a sugar, ribose. It still has a nitrogenous base, in this case adenine, and instead of one phosphate it actually has three phosphates and we know from our study of cellular respiration that these three phosphates are really important because this is where the energy that can be transferred to various cellular processes is located and we know that that last phosphate group can actually be removed and carry with it energy and donate that to another molecule such as glucose. So ATP is really just a nucleotide with a a couple of extra phosphates on it. Why is ATP significant? It's an energy shuttle within the cell. It moves energy from one molecule to another. ATP is the energy currency of life. Here's a reality check. Pause the video and see if you can answer these questions. Check your answers. How did you do? Can you explain what anti-parallel means in the context of DNA? And can you contrast DNA and RNA both structurally and functionally?